We're going to get to verse 22 in just a moment, but before we do, uh, I want to just go back just briefly. We're not going to do a real in-depth thing, but it's just going to have some thoughts that are going to lead us in uh, to verse 22. In verse 19, James says that we should be quick to hear or, or quick to listen. And, and that refers back to the hearing of God's Word, hearing it and listening to it. What would be... What, what's the purpose of that? Why, why would we need to be quick to listen to the Word of God? Listen carefully. Listen carefully. So it's not just hearing it, right? It, we have to be that quick to listen uh, is going to be a, a, an intense attentiveness, being attentive to the Word of God, and not just attentive to it, but able to comprehend it and understand it. So when... James is saying, my brothers, be quick to hear, be quick to listen. He's saying that he wants us to be attentive, uh, that's, that's paying attention with intent, and able to understand and comprehend what God's Word is trying to say to us. Uh, then in verse 21 he says, therefore, that therefore there is meant to now move us from, from comprehending and hearing the Word of God to having a response to this word that we've now heard and, and comprehended. He's, Therefore, so in response to this, we're to do something. And, and that doing is to put off all filthiness and, and rampant wickedness. That's the first process. That's the first step. Once we've been quick to hear, we've attentively listened to the Word of God, we've understood it, and we've comprehended what it's saying. Therefore, now we must be moved to respond. So we put off the old man. And then the next step is and receive... Uh, with meekness, the implanted word. So that, that move to respond then is, is a putting away, a, a putting off of the old person, putting to death, and now receiving with what? What's meekness? Humble. Humble, with humility. We have to be humble. We have to come in humility as we hear God's word, as we understand its meaning, as we hear what it's trying to say to us. Therefore, we're moved to respond by putting away the old, and then in humility, bowing before Him, surrendering, essentially is what it is, surrendering our lives to Him. We then receive the implanted Word, what it says, which is then able uh, to save our souls. And then we get to verse 22, and it has this but. What have I shared with you about the word but in Scripture? It's either good or bad. It's either good or bad. And generally, it's, it's saying... It's a, it's a negative connotation, but if, it's sort of a negative if then, but if you don't do these things, then this is going to be true of you. So we have one of those here tonight. So we have quick to listen, we're attentive, we're able to understand and comprehend God's word, therefore we're moved to respond by putting off, putting away the old man, putting him to death, receiving in humility that implanted word that buries deep within our soul that is able to save us. But, and so this but now is going to be referring to a process that is not now complete. Just because redemption is at hand, that's, that's what it's saying there. You've received the implanted word. It saved you. You have been justified. You've been redeemed. But that is not where it stops. And sadly, in the church, that's where a lot of people think they can stop. I, I've got Jesus. Now I'm good. I don't have to do anything else. James is saying that's not true. But... The process is not now complete. Now, in order, we have to move from response to this Word of God into action, into doing the Word of God. And that's what he says. But, don't just receive it and, and be able to save your souls because it's implanted in you, but be a doer of this Word that you have now received. It must move us into action. Uh, James is going to address this later on when, when we actually get to chapter 2 and we talk about uh, faith with and without works. But he's saying be a doer of the word, not only a hearer, because only hearers, he says, deceive themselves. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This hearing of the word is vital, it's critical. We, we understand that. He says we must be quick to hear it. But we can't stop at hearing only. Of course, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. And so we know that that's the first step, but that's not the final step. That's what the but is there for. The process is not complete. 
it must, we must be compelled, we must be moved into action. So we must be doers of the word. This, this phrase that he says, that all the hearers are deceiving themselves. Tell me what you think about that. It means you put some perspiration with your aspiration. <laughs> If, if you've just heard something and not acted upon it, what, what good is that? That's right. What good is it? It, it? it does no benefit whatsoever. Knowledge, the scriptures say, just puff up. It builds us up in pride. We become boastful in knowledge. Wisdom, however, is knowledge in action. It's knowledge in use. It's taking that knowledge and using it in a manner in which it's meant to be. So when we just hear, we, we gain knowledge, but we're, if we don't put it into action, it, we are nothing. And, and James, through the Word of God, is saying that you have deceived yourself. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read uh, verse 21 and 23. And, and we've gone over this before. I've preached on this before. Uh, but I want us to take a look at something here. So we don't want to deceive ourselves because that deception that James is speaking of is that you think that you have received the implanted word and that it saved you. But if you haven't been then moved into action, then you are deceiving yourselves into thinking that that word is actually been and planted you. When we dealt with the, the sower of the seed, it talks about how there's this one seed that falls and they receive it with great joy. And so there's this, this picture of they've received it and they're excited about it. But it says in that that the, the worries of this life and the riches and the things of this world choke it out. It's not allowed to implant deeply. It can't grow any roots and so it's choked out. And it says of that seed that it's killed. So he's saying don't allow that initial joy of receiving it be choked out and deceive yourself into thinking that now it's implanted in you if in fact it has died off. And so here Jesus is speaking and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, he doesn't say there that the one who believes or the one who thinks or the one who professes or the one who claims, what does it say? The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So he's saying there, there are going to be those who are going to come to me. They're going to be deceived. They've deceived themselves because they have not been moved into action to do the will of the Father. They're going to say, Lord, Lord. But he says, not everyone says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So we see this picture that Jesus is speaking of, and he's saying that the deception is real, that there are going to be some when judgment day comes, when I return and I'm coming to bring judgment. They're going to come to me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And he's going to say, I didn't know you. You deceived yourself into thinking because when you accepted it, even though you may have accepted it with great joy, the sower of the seed explains. The, the cares of this life, everything else choked out that life and it killed it, destroyed it. It wasn't real. It wasn't genuine. But because you thought it was implanted in you, you thought you had salvation, you deceived yourself. Uh, this, this example of this is found in, in Matthew 5. Turn there real quick. He, Jesus is, is speaking about hearing and, and understanding and, and, and James is, is basically echoing his, his half-brother and he's saying it's not just about hearing the letter of the law. It's not just about hearing it. I can read to you the whole New Testament and you can physically with your ears hear it, but it doesn't mean that you have heard it. Does that make sense? That you can, you can hear it, you can perceive that it's being spoken, but you haven't internalized it, you haven't taken it in, you haven't heard it. You've just heard what the letter says, but you don't understand the heart or the intent behind it. This is what Jesus illustrates in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. 
So he's saying, here's what the law says. Here's what the letter of the law, as you just read it on the surface, it says you shall not murder. And he says, but I'm going to get to the heart of the law. I'm going to get to what it means when you actually hear it and comprehend it. You shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So Jesus here is saying that it's not just about murder. See, the Pharisees knew the law, right? They heard it. They, they, they heard it. It came internally to them. They read it. They saw the surface of it. But all they saw was don't kill someone. And so they thought that because they weren't killing someone that they were justified, that they were right. But Jesus says, I'm saying to you, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of the same judgment, the same penalty that this law brings about. Verse 27, he goes in and he says the same thing. He's showing the heart of the law. He's showing the heart of the reality of these things. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, and again, this is quoting uh, directly from the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. So the letter of the law says, okay, you can't cheat. You don't commit adultery. And the Pharisees are saying, okay, we're not doing that. But here's what Jesus says in verse 28. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust, look with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if you look with lust, Jesus is saying, the heart, the intent of the law is not just that you physically cheat, but if your eyes are wandering, if you're looking with lust, that your heart has already betrayed you, it's already betrayed your spouse, it's already betrayed that person, you are guilty of adultery in the heart, even if you haven't actually committed it. That's what James is speaking of, is that we, we, we have to hear, it has to be implanted, and then we have to be doers, not just don't doers. You understand the difference? The law says don't commit adultery, so we think, okay, don't do this. But the actual intent of the law is to be pure, to be holy, so that you're not looking with lust, so that you're not uh, committing adultery of the heart. We have to be doers of this. We have to perpetuate it. It's not just about not doing it's, it's going forward and doing the intent, the heart of what God's Word says. Let's look now at, at Matthew 15. If I'm going fast, it's because I'm trying to get to something I really want to get to tonight. And I don't know if the Lord will get us there or not, but uh, we'll see. What's that? So here's the picture of the Pharisees and what they've done and their, their hearing or understanding of the law. It was a, a false perception of it. They didn't get it. And so Jesus is going to call them out on it in verse 1 of chapter 15. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Do you see what the Pharisees are asking? Not the, the commandments of the law, not what God has said. They're breaking the tradition of the elders. Who are the elders? What traditions are they breaking? They believe it's the, the, the ways of man, the, the, the teachings of man. That's all that they're talking about there. For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And look at Christ's response. This, this blows me away. As he's speaking to these religious, right, religious people of the time, those who were seen by the people as the righteous ones. He answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God, he, not, he need not honor his father, so for the sake of tradition you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He calls them out on the carpet, and Jesus says, Listen, you're concerned about them breaking the commandments of men. You're concerned about them going against your tradition, and you don't even realize that you are in violation of God's Word, His commandment, His Word to you. You've broken it for this sake of your tradition 
and you've made void the word of God, he says. And he says that Isaiah, when he prophesied about these religious guys, that he did well because he said that they're, they honor me with their lips. So with their speech, what they profess is one thing, but the actions of their heart is something very different. They honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. In vain. To no purpose is what in vain means. They worship me because they teach doctrines and commandments of men. Jesus is, is not happy with these Pharisees and these religious leaders. The reality is not what we profess. It's what we do. We can hear the Word of God and we can claim we love it. We can claim we follow it. We can claim we love Him. We can claim we follow Him. But the proof is going to be in the pudding, as they say. What is it that is in the intention of our heart? What is it that we are actually doing? You've heard me say it. I'll say it again. I'll probably say it till the Lord takes me home or whenever. What we profess will always be betrayed by what we do if they differ. That's the prophecy of the Pharisees right there. You claim that you honor me with your lips. What you profess is one thing. But your heart, it's far from me. It's not genuine. There is no genuine faith and action about you there. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> we're, we're dealing with this, this just not hearing the Word, but doing the Word. The, the, the point of it is to lead to a, a certain reality in our lives of, of a genuine, mature Faith, and, and so this is what the Apostle Paul is speaking of in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we'll begin in verse 11. <clears throat> and he, that he there is God, God the Father, he gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for, for a purpose. There, there's a reason that he's given these leaders, these men, to the church. And here's what it is. To equip the saints... To hear the word of God. Do you ever read that way? Anybody's translation read that way? What, what are the leaders of the church? The shepherd, the teacher, that literally means pastor or overseer, is to equip. Equip means to give you, to make you ready and able to perform something. Well, what are you supposed to perform? Who, are, who is he giving this to? The saints, that's the people of God, through the preaching of God's word for the work of ministry. Is work of ministry just something abstract? What is work of ministry? Work of God. It's, it's doing, right? It's right. work. It's action. God has given leaders to the church, people who are going to shepherd and teach uh, and equip you through the preaching of God's word, through the teachings of God's word, so that you are able and ready and prepared to fulfill and do the work of ministry. You see, it's not about just hearing. I'm not here. That, that's, that's my job description, by the way, in case you're confused. I'm not here to just fill you with knowledge. I hope you learn something. I hope you gain something as we come together and as I teach and as I preach. But it's not about the knowledge. It's not just about hearing it. I'm doing these things. I'm Digging deep into the Scriptures so that you are equipped and prepared to fulfill the ministry. To do the work that God has given the church to do. That's what it's all about. So that, that the purpose of all this is for the building up of the body of Christ. Not necessarily building up in numbers, although that will happen whenever, whenever people are on fire for God and the gospel is going out and the Spirit is alive and moving, God's going to add numbers. You see that in the book of Acts. But that's not what that's talking about. Paul is talking about a building up of maturity. How do I know? Because he goes on to explain it. Until, this is built up until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The end game, the reality is that we are mature in Christ. That we are mature in Him. And then that what James says, let's look back. You don't have to turn there, I'll just turn back. Um, <clears throat> verse 4, the reason for trials, the reason for that testing of our faith is to show that it's genuine, 
so that it can produce perseverance. And in verse 4 it says, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And that word perfect means spiritual maturity, being fully grown, mature in Jesus Christ. So God gives these people, these leaders to the church to equip them through the preaching and teaching of God's words, the work of ministry, to build the church up into the full stature, the mature manhood of Christ. Why? Here's, here's the crux of it. And this goes back to hearing the word and doing the word and understanding and comprehending. So that, verse 14 of Ephesians 4, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. We not only have to hear the truth, hear the word of God, we not only have to then believe in it, we don't only have to then respond to it by putting away and receiving, but the process is not done. We have to be doers of it because when we're doing it, when we're active and alive in it, we won't get caught up and all the false teaching. We won't get caught up in every wind of doctrine that's out there. All the craftiness and cunning schemes of, of the enemy who's there simply to steal, kill, and destroy. He's looking, church, to whom he may devour. Is he looking for the lost to devour? No. He's already got them. He doesn't care about them. He's going after the church. He's going after me. He's going after you, and He's seeking whom He may devour, whom He may steal, kill, and destroy. And He's going to use any craftiness and kindness and wickedness, every wind of doctrine. Have you not seen it in the church, especially in the church of America? All this false teaching, these false gospels, this easy believism, this prosperity nonsense, it's there, it's rampant, and it's spreading. James says, don't just be deceived, but be a doer of this truth. Be a doer of this word. So verse 23. <coughs> back in James, you can turn back there. He's going to compare the person who hears and doesn't do to this, this person that he talks about in verse 23 beginning. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, so they've heard it, they've understood it. Which, by the way, this is, this is pertinent to what we're doing on Sunday nights, right? Wasn't there a man who heard the word of God? The word of God came to Jonah, and he heard it, and we, we, we broke it down. It wasn't a, a cryptic message, right? It was simple. Arise, that means get up. Go to Nineveh, that means go to Nineveh. And call out against it. That means call out against it. There's nothing secretive to it. So he heard it and he comprehended it. Did he do it? No. No. So Jonah is just like this person that James is about to describe. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away at once and forgets what he is like. What, what do you use a mirror for? See yourself. See yourself? Ladies, what do you use a mirror for? Guys don't. Put on my hair. <laughs> Prim. Prim. What, what are you working on when you're looking in the mirror? Face. Face. What? No. But that, you try to make yourself look better. What? What? You're, you're dealing with your outside, right? Your, the externals, the, what you look like on the outside, because that's all the mirror is going to reflect. It's not going to reflect the inside. It's not going to reflect the true character of your nature. So when you're using this mirror, you're making adjustments, you're beautifying, you're doing whatever to the external. Can you ever use a mirror then to work on what's inside? To fix that kind of stuff? No. no. It, it doesn't work that way. The mirror simply reflects... That's what everybody can see. And yet, this person looks into the mirror and they see themselves. And because they're not doers, they, they just immediately forget even how bad off they are, essentially is what it is. You see, Jesus speaks to this too when he's talking to the Pharisees. Again, over and over, the people that Jesus always came against, it was never 
those who were, were sinners, who were in need, who were crying out, He supped with them, He ministered to them, He loved them, and He taught them, and He, he brought them to correction and repentance. But it was the religious folks, those people that thought they had it right, thought they had it together. He, those are the ones who came again. Let's look at uh, Matthew 23. There's two verses here that I, I want us to really pay attention, but I want to read the whole discourse because it's going to show this, this picture in whole, what, what Jesus is referring to and what, and what this picture that we're talking about, about looking into a mirror, forgetting, not being a doer, but just trying to put on this facade and fix this external and all that stuff, kind of stuff. 23, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. So right there, we already have a problem. What they're saying, what they're telling of others, they don't even themselves do. They don't practice what they preach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with even a finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. That, he's talking about their robes and their garments. They had all these ropes and cords and things that, that were uh, showed how pious they were and, and how religious they were. And they love the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace and being called a rabbi by others. But you are not to be called a rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have only one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. There's that, that, that spirit of humility there again that he's speaking of. But woe to you. Which, by the way, we, we addressed this in Isaiah a little bit when I preached on that. But woe was a, a curse. It was calling down the curse and judgment of God. So Jesus is calling down the curse and judgment of God on the Pharisees. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor those, or nor allow those who would go in and enter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he has become a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by this oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, If anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And, and these next verses are the ones I really want us to focus on. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean out the inside of the cup and plate, and the outside may also then be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. James is, is referring back to this and he's saying the man that, that hears the word and doesn't do it is like these Pharisees. 
they've cleaned up, but they haven't realized that the reflection they've seen is only of the exterior, only that which they can mend and clean up, and they don't recognize that their insides are full of dead man's bones, wicked, rotting, death, decaying. This is who is like the person who hears the word and doesn't do it. Now, having said that, is that a kind of person that you want to be tonight? Mark, you want to be like that? Beth? Jerry? No. BR? We'll just go down the line. Oscar? Betty? Irene? Terry? Irvin? Becky? Amanda? Joanne? Lindsay? No? Stephen? You sure? I mean, it's a good lot. <laughs> AJ, Edna, how about you? Surely one, one person's going to be like <laughs> <laughs> So we've heard that Christ pronounces judgment, brings down the curse of heaven upon these kind of people. James is liking these people to that. Yet, do we not have people in the church who hear the word of God? They'll never confess that that's who they want to be, but by their actions, they prove that that's who they are. Again, what we profess, what we claim, is going to be betrayed by what we do if they do So James says that this person who is a hearer only and not a doer, they don't understand, they don't see. So the reality for us then is that the Bible is a reflector. It's going to show what's right and what's genuine. It's going to flesh out what is on the inside. This is a mirror that can cut through the heart of man. This is a mirror that can lay bare and expose all. That's what Hebrews says. The Word of God is sharp like a two-edged sword, able to cut through every division and every joint and the bone and marrow and separate and lay bare everything that's on the inside. The Word of God is going to reflect to us who... We really are. And it's going to show us whether we're just hearers or if in fact we are doers. If we have genuine faith that we've talked about all the way up to this journey or if we're just playing a game professing something that's not real in our lives. The Sunday school class, I brought this up before, but just think of this ladies. What he, what he just said. So if you're getting ready in the morning and you see you see a speck on your face, can you just look at that speck and then forget about it and turn around and walk off and not do anything about it? Because that's what the Word of God brings something out in our lives. I mean, do we deal with that? Or do we, can we turn and walk away from it? Because you ladies wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't walk out of the house with a piece of mud on your face that Seen Notice he's only addressing the ladies because that's do It's all right. <laughs> that's a good point. It's a, it's a, a physical picture of a spiritual reality there. Uh, that's what the Word of God does so often, so well. Looks at himself, goes away, forget what he looks like. The, it, there's been no impact when he hears and doesn't do. There's no change. There's no, there's no difference. They, they've forgotten who they really are and what they truly are inside. And Jesus proclaims woe on those people, calls them hypocrites. So we get to verse 25. And this is where we're going to stop. This is going to take forever. Verse 25, we have another but. This but's not a negative but. It's it's a, a butt of hope. It's a, a butt that's going to lead somewhere that's good. But the one who looks, and so he's saying the one who's going to intently look into this mirror, and it, he calls this mirror into what? What's the mirror? The perfect law? The law of liberty. Uh, and I want to stop just right there in that part of the verse, and we'll probably have to pick up the rest of it later. But. So the one who looks, so it's this intentional, deliberate looking into a mirror. The mirror in this case, he says, is the perfect law, the law of liberty. What's he talking about there? Okay, those are good answers. The scriptures. 
He's talking about the Word of God. The perfect law. The law of liberty. What does that mean? What does liberty mean? Freedom. Freedom. How, how is the law a law of freedom? You beat death. You beat death. You see, the Bible says that the law holds us, holds sway over us. It, it holds us captive and, and under its condemnation, under its judgment. So how is that liberty? Well, this law of liberty that James is speaking of is not the, the Old Testament law. It's not the Old Covenant because we're now under something new, right? The New Covenant, the Gospel. But it's still all the Word of God. The Old Covenant still is valid for us. It still matters to us. We still must read it and observe it. But he's saying that this law of liberty, you remember what Jesus said? You will know the truth. What's the truth? Freedom from sin and Bible. The truth is this. This is the truth. It's the only truth. It's the absolute truth. The only truth in all of the world. You will know the truth. And what will the truth do? That you set you free. free. Jesus said he is the truth. He said he is the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. That's singular for those who aren't all that great in English. Singular, the only truth that exists. So how do we reconcile that? How do we say that the Word of God is, is the truth, and, but that Jesus says that He's the truth? Well, that's because Jesus is the Word. Remember in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in Him all things were made. And then later on, I think it's verse 12 or 14 or somewhere in there in John chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh, and He dwelled among us, and we beheld He's Alpha Omega. Beginning and end. He is the perfect law. So we look into Christ. We, we examine our lives on Him, not anything else. We don't measure up to one another. We don't measure up to what the culture says. We don't measure up to even what the church says unless the church is saying the Word of God. We look into, with intent, into the perfect law, the Word of God, the law of liberty, that which sets us free. And it says there, and we persevere. Right? That's a word we've dealt with in James. Why must we persevere? It's going to test our faith. It's going to see that that's genuine. That perseverance is going to develop in us something that's going to be critical as we move along. So as we look into Christ, as we look into His Word, as we look into His character and who He is, and we gain freedom in that, we persevere. It says, being no hearer who forgets. He just dealt with that, the man that looks and forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in His doing. So, what does it mean to look into the perfect law? What does it mean to look into God's Word, to allow it to examine us, to allow it to penetrate us, to allow it to flesh out all that is bad in us and expose it so that we can repent of it and do away with it, so that we can see that we're in failure, so that we know that we must act and move and, and do and be a doer of the Word through action, not just simply hearing. Let's look at Psalm 119. And this is what we're going to close on. This may take a while. My intention when I, when I was studying this out, <clears throat> Psalm 119, by the way, is, is the psalmist is writing about the greatness of God's Word, His commandments, His statutes, His precepts. There are many different numbers of words that He uses to address the Word of God. And Psalm 119 deals with that. And so I was going through and I was just going to read a few verses and I was going to make a few highlights and, and I'll just lift it up here and show you. As I was doing that, I just kept going and kept going and kept highlighting and kept highlighting until I got to the very end. And I thought, well, how do I pick and choose? And so I prayed and, and the Lord just laid on my heart, read the whole thing. So I hope you'll indulge me tonight. I'm going to try, if I start getting dry mouth, maybe someone can, can pick it up where I leave off. But it's 176 verses, so it takes a, a little bit, but it is so rich and so amazing. Okay, so let's look at what, what James says here. We, we look into the perfect law, the law of liberty. We persevere. That means we stand steadfast. We endure by doing, not just hearing, and we will be blessed in what we do. 
The very first word, the very first word in Psalm 119 is blessed. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Is walking just a passive thing? No. It's active, right? It's an action. Walking in the law of the Lord, that's the first way that he words the word of God. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, testimonies being another form that he uses for the word of God, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways, his ways again, referring to God's word. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in the riches. I will meditate on your precepts. I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, the cursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt for I have kept your testimonies. Even though the princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. My soul clings to dust. Give me life according to your word. Do you remember that James says that when this, this word is received with meekness and humility and it's implanted in us, it's able to save our souls. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the ways of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. 